Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Helen Wellington, also known as uh, uh, Helen McCoubrey Burke, um, who has performed with uh, 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 the chefs and um, uh, Helen and the Horn. Just listening to everybody else talk, I've completely jettisoned what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm winging it a little bit. Um, I teach at the University of East London, which is based in Stratford, and I teach music students. Um, a lot of them are very involved in DJing and rapping, electronica and that kind of thing. And I was employed there to kind of encourage the students who weren't um, looking into computer and programming most of the time, which um, was quite a minority of students when I started working there. It's quite strange hearing the other talks being, um, being the bad guy, really, um, because uh, obviously once you work in an institution, you're part of that institution and you, you do become slightly institutionalised. Although my um, history of education is really quite different from a lot of my colleagues because I did a lot of my education while I was actually at the university, while I did my PhD while I was at the university, um, at quite a um, ripe old age, really. I started off learning music um, not through um, classical channels. I really rebelled against that. I couldn't understand it. It sounded horrible. It hurt my ears. It was my parents' music. Um, and I wasn't brought up to enjoy um, making music at all until punk came along. And uh, the guys in my squad told me that I had to play bass guitar in their band. Um, because it was an instrument that um, guys didn't want to play because you couldn't show off with one. But you could show off if you were a guitarist because it's lots of notes, and you could show off if you were a singer because you were standing there in the front. And um, I was very quiet, and so I did what I was told, and realised that it's really, really enjoyable making vibrations go through the floor and hit people in the chest, which is what playing bass guitar is all about. <laughs> and <coughs> because I learned... Um, from, I, I learned from listening to other people, and I learned from disagreeing with other people as well. Um, and there's a kind of myth that you, uh, that you sort of learn from your peers just from positive, <laughs> positive learning. I learned from negative learning. I was told, oh, you have to play this, you have to play that. And I, I thought, no, I don't. I have, to play, I, I have to play what I want, which was a really, really good way of learning because you develop your own technique and your own style, which is what pop music is all about. Going into education as a teacher was quite a surprise. Um, I thought I wanted to be involved in politics because punk is about politics as well as music. I did work at the Labour Party for a year. I loved it, but there wasn't any music there, so I left and started working um, at the University of Westminster's new pop music course, which had just started in about, it's about 2000, oh, sorry, 1995. Um, I was taken on because I'd been in a band, and it was thought that being in a band would be a really useful thing to have uh, because most of the people who were teaching on the course, although they'd played in bands, hadn't actually kind of started up a band from scratch. I discovered that um, with the type of musicians who were being um, taken onto the course, a lot of them couldn't be music, and I can't be music either, um, even though I've made lots of music and I've had it broadcast and that kind of thing. So I was teaching people like me. The difference between myself and them was that they had opted into coming into university to do a degree. Um, in some respects, they were quite unusual students. It was the very first cohort of students who'd ever come to a university to do a pop music degree that was just a pop music degree and wasn't part of a classical or jazz degree. So they were kind of pop heads, which was um, quite interesting because they, they were kind of accustomed to the idea that people would resist what they were learning and what they were doing. And it was quite difficult, I think, for some of my colleagues to understand just how little they knew about um, dots we call them, you know, those little things. I used to have nightmares that crotchets and quavers stung my legs, you know. <laughs> so I could, see how they, I could see how they found it really, really difficult. The thing is that it, it is an institute of higher education. Where I teach now, UEL, is also a, an institute of higher education. And I had to kind of go against my instincts, which was anti-education, um, and try to understand why I was there and what the students wanted from people like me. Um, it's almost like turning into the enemy without really meaning to. <laughs> and I started to see it as uh, to be more about empowerment than anything else. Because 
I could see that I was teaching a lot of students who were black, who were female, who were um, from Asian backgrounds, who were from families, particularly now at UEL, families who've never sent a child to university before. And actually they don't really know how to learn. And one of the things that you have to teach them first of all is how to learn. But you also have to teach them why it's necessary to learn things. And um, in this respect, I've got a kind of ambivalent feeling about um, some of what's been talked about tonight because um, I have to convince the students that I teach that it's worth learning the very complex academic terminology that the books that um, those of us who sort of study at MA and PhD level have to um, take on board because that's the language that powerful people speak. And I don't think I'm a proper educator unless I teach the students that I teach how to speak the language that powerful people speak, because that's the only way that they're going to get to the places that I think they ought to be. And to get them to do that, even though they really, really resist reading Theodore Adorno and you know all of those people that uh, we <coughs> ran down their throats, even though we, don't, we prefer not to, <laughs> even though they resist that, I think it's so important that they that they do learn to engage with things that they wouldn't be interested in unless I kind of drip fed them week by week. Because otherwise we're always going to have a House of Commons full of white men. And the things that the students that I teach care about are never going to percolate up to those levels. My worry about um, open source learning is the element of choice because I think a lot of the students that I teach wouldn't choose to learn the things that I teach them because the value of learning those things is not explained enough in open source learning. The idea of empowerment and the politics of education that um, comes about through um, the dodges that a person has to learn as a lecturer to trick people into learning, to convince them of its value as an empowering, um, as a, 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 um, in empowerment. And, I'm very interested in what everybody said tonight. I'm very, very interested in it. Um, we are told not to use Wikipedia. We're told to, we're told to tell the students not to use Wikipedia. Um, I think that's because we're, we teach the students to analyse and to challenge, and Wikipedia is facts, and we're, sort of, we're, we're trying to get them to think in terms of concepts. Um, I did look myself up on Wikipedia, and the information was wrong. So, I mean, it's been corrected since then, but um, I think um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here and to hear all this information because it's obvious that um, there's, I'm quite a long distance in one way um, from what's being said at the other end of the spectrum, but there's quite a large area of overlap, and um, that area of overlap is actually the empowerment idea. And as far as I'm concerned, education is politics, and politics is education. That's all I've got to say. Mm -hmm.